In this series of videos I'm designing a Z80 based computer system. So far I've put together the basic system. It's a very discreet design so that's really my main goal for this project is to avoid the use of any large scale integration devices other than the uh, Z80 itself of course. So I've got a um, multibank system. It uses DRAM for the uh, main system RAM. It uses SRAM for the video RAM. It's got a discrete video output system and it's got um, all the other sort of basic elements required for a computer system. So it's got interrupt control, it's got a keyboard interface, but it does not require um, RS-232 and a terminal to operate it. It will be a standalone machine although it will have RS-232 in the final version. I had originally intended to make this video about the systems aspect of designing something like this. This project is more about how to go about designing a computer rather than um, how to design this particular machine. I will be publishing a book that details everything that I'm covering here, but in far more detail of course. There's only so much I can put into the videos. and this uh, video is actually an extra one I decided to insert into the series in response to a couple of questions that I thought were fairly interesting. Now it's a subject I have covered already in previous videos but I haven't really gone into it in any depth and it's a fairly minor thing but something that is uh, fairly uh, important to some people less so to others and that is the artifacts that we see on the screen whenever a, uh, a change is made in the video RAM. So I'll move the camera across and we can see what I'm talking about. So looking at the computer monitor, if I start moving the cursor around, what you can hopefully see is a series of artifacts, little bright flecks or flashes that occur randomly around the screen. And we get the same thing if I start entering. So as you can see, each time I hit a key, we get an artifact. And it's in a random location each time. It's random size and I don't particularly mind them, but they do get uh, a bit irritating after a while, I suppose. But the question was, can they be removed? And if so, how difficult is it to do that? Now, as I said, I had covered this in an earlier video and said that I purposefully disabled this um, particular feature. And the second question I mentioned was, well, why would I disable this feature and not just include it? It doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. I just seem to be making life more difficult for myself. So I'll move the camera back and explain why I decided to disable this feature until later in the project. So I'll begin by explaining what's actually causing this. Uh, most of you may already know, but I'll go over this anyway. And um, to help, I've prepared a simplified block diagram of the video system. And as I say, I'll go into this in much more detail in the book, but I uh, thought I'd cover it here because it is quite an interesting topic in its own right. So the way this video system works is we have a series of video counters that are used to determine where on the screen we should currently be plotting the next pixel. That's used to feed an address to our video RAM. That selects the particular RAM address, i.e. the character we want to display at a particular location on the screen. That data is latched and that in turn is fed through to a character ROM and the character ROM contains all the bitmaps required to actually assemble and create the images of the characters. That's sent through to a shift register and turned into a serial form that can be fed through to the terminal, to the uh, monitor. Um, now this is a fairly dynamic process and it goes on continuously. We can't stop it, pause it, interrupt it, otherwise we would end up with a a synchronization problem and we get all sorts of weird uh, behavior of the display. So we can't pause this uh, while we do something else. The other thing to bear in mind is that the value currently being 
um, latched into the buffer is not the same data that is currently being sent in latched into the shift register even though they're fed by effectively the same signal uh, they are different values because uh, the latch lags behind the shift register by one address and it's designed like that so that they overlap and it maximizes the throughput of this system and we don't have to wait for the ROM to respond but we do of course need to be able to modify the contents of the SRAM otherwise we can't write any characters to it so the Z80 needs to be able to read from the SRAM and write to the SRAM but of course in doing so it also needs to be able to supply its own address because it needs to determine uh, where it's going to write the data to if it didn't do that it would just be writing to random locations based on the current uh, value in the counters but when it does that um, and the way it does that is to have this multiplexer that switches between uh, either the Z80 address bus or the counters in order to select the address that's fed through to the SRAM but when we switch to the Z80 address then of course the scanning of the display is still going on and although it only takes a, uh, a few nanoseconds to update the SRAM during that time if the shift register is loaded it will be loaded with the wrong value because if for example the scanning uh, video counters were at this location but the Z80 wants to read or write down here then the wrong address would be selected for the scanning circuits and hence the wrong value would be sent through to the latch and we've also got this bi-directional buffer that's just used to allow data to be sent from or back to the Z80 so it's quite a simple system but requires some control logic but the upshot is uh, we can't kind of stop the world and uh, wait for the data to be written to the SRAM we need to find some way to update the SRAM and also remove the artifacts without stopping this process so the um, actual solution is, is incredibly simple all we have to do is blank the video out whenever we update the SRAM that's whether we read it or whether we write it and that way the row value that was latched um, and sent through into the shift register doesn't end up being shifted out onto the display the uh, main issue really is exactly how to go about doing that because the loading of the shift register is asynchronous relative to the accessing of the SRAM that is the Z80 can access the SRAM any time and we don't know exactly when that's going to occur in the scanning circuits that are controlling the display now you could of course synchronize that but that would minimize and reduce your uh, effective video bandwidth and because I might want to add video to this system later I don't want to have to uh, effectively wait for certain uh, parts of the um, the video updates such as retrace because that would seriously limit the amount of video bandwidth that we have so there's another easier solution as I say it's just to um, blank the video output at the right time so although the uh, required um, device is already on the board it's a spare flip-flop um, that I'll be using it's actually already um, included in the next version of the board but um, what I want to do is just demonstrate why I currently have it disabled so I'll move the camera back across this is all switched on of course this is the circuit that I'm talking about I'll show you the schematic in a minute and it's disabled because I have the jumper um, in the wrong position it's not connected to that circuit so I'll now enable this by moving the jumper this is just connected to the external blank input to the board which is really meant for video input but um, we can use it for this purpose this would normally be an internal function of the board so I move the camera back across so the circuit is now enabled I'll move the cursor around and as you can hopefully see the artifacts have been completely removed 
and it's the same if I enter any text. So hopefully as you can see, that's completely resolved the issue and it completely removes those uh, flashes. I'll disable the circuit again so we can do a side-by-side -side comparison. So it's now disabled, I'll move the cursor and as you can see the artifacts have returned. I'll re-enable it one more time. Move the cursor again. So as you can see it's 100% successful in removing the artifacts. So the next question is why would I want to disable it? What I'm going to do now is disable another function on the board and the reasoning behind this will hopefully become even more apparent in the next video when I start looking at the systems level design of something like this. But I'm disabling another function on the board, the sort of thing I might want to do if I'm carrying out certain types of testing. And I'll now press the key. Notice that the display has gone completely blank. I haven't switched it off, it's just uh, the display has been blanked. So I'll re-enable the circuit that I've just disabled and you can see the display has come back. Now I didn't disable the video circuits, it's a completely separate circuit, but because of the way that the system has various interdependencies it can cause this type of effect. Um, however if I now disable both circuits, that's the one I've just disabled that blanks the video, in fact I'll do that first, I'll press the key, notice that the display has gone blank. If I now disable this artifact removal circuit notice that although we have artifacts back we can at least see the display so that's really why I have this disabled it just makes uh, testing far more straightforward okay I'll move the camera back and uh, we'll look at this in a bit more detail so that's why I have the circuit disabled because if I have it enabled and then I try to disable other parts of the system for certain testing I end up with a blank display and um, a valuable part of the testing for this system is the display itself and it's quite a useful thing to have uh, when I'm testing something like this because it does give us a lot of information about what's going on within the system. So what is this circuit? Obviously it's very simple it's just a flip-flop. Now the flip-flop works by monitoring the uh, video RAM chip enable line. We can't use that on its own for reasons I'll now demonstrate on the scope. So we'll do a single capture, press the key, and hopefully you can see on the scope the yellow trace is the video RAM chip enable line and you can see it's quite a short duration uh, pulse. This comes directly from the Z80 in response to a memory write or memory read and of course the video RAM chip enable um, is common to both the video RAM read and the video RAM write uh, functions. However we can't use it on its own, although what we're looking for is a low pulse, we can't use it on its own because the short duration pulse we're seeing here could occur at any time in the uh, shift load cycle of the video output shift register. So let's say for example it occurred just after the shift register was loaded uh, and then it uh, cleared, we'd end up with the wrong value being shifted out of the shift register. So it might blank the first two bits for example but then the remaining six bits will be shifted out and cause an artifact on the screen. And because the uh, two functions are asynchronous, the amount of, or effectively the size of the artifact is going to vary depending on exactly where in this load shift uh, cycle the Z80 decides to access the video RAM. So what we can do is and we can make use of the load feature because what we want to actually have happen is whenever the Z80 tries to access the SRAM by either a read or write instruction we want to start to immediately start blanking the video out 
and as you can see that's what happened the bottom purple trace is the blanking signal coming out of this circuit and that's what's fed through into the video blanking part of the video mixer circuit but if we were just to clear this here then the rest of this portion of the pulse would allow the uh, incorrect bits to be shifted out of the shift register but what we can do is start the or latch our flip-flop immediately when the Z80 tries to access the video RAM and we can do that by clearing it using the video RAM chip enable line it will then stay set until um, the load signal arrives at the shift register in other words it would stay in its uh, blanked state until the entire uh, byte had been shifted out of the shift register and then the same signal that loads the shift register would also clear the flip-flop and that's what we've got in the circuit so the video RAM chip enable clears the flip-flop that causes the uh, Q output to go low this is fed through to the blanking circuit and that causes the display to blank it's not blanking the entire display of course it's only blanking the bit that's currently being scanned so it turns anything white into black and vice versa it actually inverts it but uh, it just prevents the artifacts from showing and then we feed the load signal into the clock input of the flip-flop and so when we get the next load signal that will cause the flip-flop to be cleared and the Q output will go back high as we can see on the scope and that will occur on the next rising edge of this signal as we can see here the blue trace is this load signal so each of these blue pulses is a full uh, cycle so that's it's going to load an 8-bit byte into the shift register and in this period it shifts out those 8 bits to the display the width of this pulse is going to be variable because as I said the load signal is asynchronous compared to the uh, read write operation of the Z80 so you'll find this pulse varies in length and if I do a few more captures you'll notice that the phase or relative timing of the yellow pulse is it varies um, from the uh, blue clock signal so I'll do a few more captures if you can see that one's different it's fairly similar and that one's different again so you can see that the relative timing of these two is it varies the start of the blanking signal is also at the same point relative to the video RAM uh, chip enable line but the width of the blank it's you can see this is a lot wider and that is just to make sure that it's not cleared until all the bits have been shifted out of the shift register and that guarantees that we don't end up with any rogue bits appearing on the display so I hope that made some sense and the reason it's so simple to implement on this system is because of the systems level approach that I've taken to designing the circuits and that's what I will look at in the next video I'll discuss the system level approach to designing these circuits and that means that implementing something such as the artifact removal is extremely straightforward